Hello, hello, hello. Well, before I resume our usual programming, I thought I'd do something different. Shocking, I know. And this one is discussion that I have been fighting the urge to have for some time. Not that it's groundbreaking or revolutionary or... Not that it has anything to do with uh, what we normally talk about here. It's more of a message of hope, and it's coming from an unlikely source. Well, of course, this is just my opinion. Just viewed through the prism of my own little me. Of course, it deals with, as ever, the overarching theme, I suppose, of most of what I do here. It deals with the theory that there are forces aligned against us, conducting what appears to be an anti-human agenda. And so, armed with cookie and beer... In the usual holiday accoutrement, we set out to display a message of hope. Now, there can be discussion on who this enemy is, from whence they came, but that's not tonight. Bear with me, brevity not be my strong suit. Now, I want to say up front that the slideshow that you're looking at has nothing to do with anything that I'm speaking about. This is just simply a bunch of images that I conjured up using these robot technologies that we're just kind of trying to set the theme since this is obviously a visual platform. Don't know where I'm going with this. We'll see where we end up. Well, when I see headlines that say things like, you know, oil tankers are bad, but their carbon footprint is nothing compared to a, that of a child. You know, a New York Times article is saying that there's 8 billion people on Earth, but he wishes that there were none. And things like that, beyond the point of self-deprecation to the point of self Loathing, I self-absorbed and self-loathing at the same time. It's rather, rather amazing. To me, in my pea brain, this seems to me like a anti-human agenda. Now, who's pushing this? I don't know. It could be just people. They want control and power. But to me, to be truly anti-human to this scale implies something that's, you know, not human. This leads me to the supposition of aliens, demons, trans-dimensional entities. I don't know. All the same to me. But it seems like to accomplish their goals, they need people. Willing participants, unwilling participants, however they get them. And this community if you can call it that, often talks about the humans that are used to push agendas and messages that run contrary to most things good and pure. Many of those stemming from places like Hollywood, which seem to me now to be a carefully sculpted strategy, a honeypot, if you will, to attract a particular type of character, talented, charismatic, likable people, with a particular element of mm -hmm, selfishness, maybe? The ability to seek fame or be allured by fame or the prospect of fame and get hooked on that drug and be coerced into doing just about anything and filter this through actual talent that they possess. And you know how it goes. They don't go out and find stars. Stars come to them. Stars come to Hollywood. The old saying, you know, you gotta make it in this business, kid. You gotta go to Hollywood. And so they go. And it is there that I believe, whether it's geomancy, whether it's whether it's a street healer, whether it's a shaman, whether it's a witch doctor, it's a fortune teller, we know humans have this ability. Too much smoke for there not to be a fire. Too many healings from pastors. Too many things have actually happened. Well, at least I, I've come to understand that channeling is a real thing. It happens on both sides. I mean, any type of spirit, it seems like, can find a willing participant. Some not so willing. And I think some channeling is very subtle. Some artists maybe think it's their own idea and just happens to be pushing this agenda. Maybe some of them ask for it blatantly and make deals with the devil, per se. I know I'm, I'm painting with very broad strokes here because what I'm trying to get to is the idea that while well, we often focus on the negative channeling, the negative Hollywood that's always marching in lockstep, they always seem to be coaxing us along down different corridors, culling humanity into some place that they, they want us and they think they're just doing art. And meanwhile, we're like, predictive programming! And maybe it's neither. Maybe it's literally just other beings planting ideas in people's heads and speaking through them to affect us. And we know that happens. Well, I feel like this is an avenue that has been explored and kind of ignored. Not totally, but kind of ignored by, let's call them the good guy. The general term for people who just want life and love and, and freedom for people. For all people. And I feel like so many avenues have been shut down in our world. As far as information, where do we go? Who do you trust? No one. No channel's pure. No, no television personality is pure. No politician is pure. Everyone has their own agenda, their own angle. And even if that's not true, we don't believe that that's not true. We don't trust it. We can't. And so it's here I want to find hope in an unlikely source. And that's a source that we normally don't look to for anything of real relevance. And that's the realm of fiction. Predominantly, fantasy fiction. Now, I know this sounds contrary to the Dungeons & Dragons scares of the 80s and some of the darker elements and the celebration of dark magic and things that camp comes with some of that. To be sure, that's there. But just as in Hollywood, just as in every area of life, there are there's a mixture of good and bad. There are some outstanding and I think hopeful lessons to be picked up on from various artists in the fiction realm. Again, whether they're doing this intentionally, whether they're being guided by, an, by I, I don't know. But I do understand something about humanity and culture. And there's a couple things that are, are play out in every culture that I know of, and I definitely searched through this to try to figure out if I was accurate in this, and that is that every culture, amongst other things, has music. In fact, there's a music for every mood. There's a music for romance. There's a music for energy, for sports, for war, for times of sadness, for death, for 
rainy days, for sleeping, for hyperactivity, for working, for studying, for dancing, for playing. There's music for everything. I mean, you can go find a playlist and be like, ah, I just kind of feel like, you know, like, sort of like, you know, like, like loungy, kind of like pajama wearing, but like, you know, a Saturday morning, you know, lazy day kind of vibes, you know, and boom, you'll have some playlist out there someone's made for that moment because music and the resonance, it affects us. And it's a huge part of humanity. And another thing that it, it seems to be a profound part of human nature is myth. By myth, I don't mean falseness. I don't mean something that's untrue or a lie or a fable. What I mean is, a story, a character, a situation, um, that which we can learn from and grow from. And in the realm of myth, fact is not necessary. And it's that element right there that I think sets it apart. Right now, in this day and age, the way we are in modern thought, what we would call red-pilled kind of thought, that's what kind of sets it apart. Let me explain. Take the famous mythology that we know, the Greeks and the Romans. Now, do the Greeks pray to some of these gods? No doubt they did. Do they really believe that Zeus hurled thunderbolts from his hand and did some of the outlandish things that Zeus has been said to do? Literally, probably not. I find that highly unlikely. Yet everyone knows the words for things like tantalus, narcissus, sirens, singing you to shipwreck. These are being incorporated in our everyday language. But did they actually happen? It's kind of irrelevant, and no one's really giving it any serious thought. The plight of tantalus, the labors of Hercules, these are the things that we learn from. And every grounded culture, by that I mean group of people, tribe of people, seems to need these to be able to explain to themselves the nature of their surroundings, their relationship with the creator, their relationship with the world around them, with each other, and you need myth. And in modern America, I believe, since I was a child, to me, the myths that I grew up with were the Spider-Mans, the Supermans, those characters you could relate to. They had day jobs. They were modern myths. Spider-Man as a possibility never entered the equation. But what was important was that with great power comes great responsibility. What I believe to be one of the most powerful myths of any culture. The origin story. The story of creation. Now, I went through as many as I could find origin stories before this, and they are all over the place. Humans have been, according to the various legends and myths of our current times, we've been defecated out, we have grown from cosmic eggs, we've been made from clay, we have been hatched from seeds. Countless ways that we have in our various cultures here. Countless stories have been told about our origin. Whether it's holy books or oral tradition, they're all over the place. My favorite creation myth I've ever heard, this includes the Bible, includes every holy book, is Tolkien's origin story of Middle Earth. It resonates with me in a way that nothing else ever has. And I think this is for two reasons. One is because of all the origin stories on Earth and all the cultures, none of them have the world being created by music. None of them. Certain times were spoken into existence. Certain times, I mean, that's where the word, you know, universe comes from, like the one verse, the one expressed statement. So that's kind of a given. And there's a few words. I think uh, uh, Irish have one where the a flute player animates clay figures. Uh, the Hopi Indian have one where the spider mother sort of sings these people to life. But not the whole world created via song. And I find that to be odd. I mean, he, music is, an, as we've discussed, an integral part of our existence. I believe that this affects me so much, and I believe it to be so powerful, be also what I discussed earlier, and that is it's not encumbered with the idea of it being real. And this is what fiction has going for it right now, and I think this is why we need to give it a little more attention. Because we don't have to be encumbered with the idea, well, well what are the logistics behind Adam and Eve producing all the various races from their loins. How big would Noah's Ark have to be to contain all these creatures? What time period are we looking at? You know, what era? Is this actually historical? Can it be backed by fact? All these things that sidetrack, all these things that just take away from the important part of stories, which is the reader connecting with character. You open up a book, you think you're finding a story, you're not. You're finding people, you're finding an author. You are connecting with another, another viewpoint. When you get involved in a story, you are most likely getting involved in a character or characters. In case of Tolkien, there might be hundreds. No sidetracking. No one is worried about Aslan from Narnia is trying to lure you into his cult. You just focus on his words and listen to the story. You don't have to second guess, well, was this actually translated properly? Did Gandalf really say that? Did the monks get it right? Or are they adding their own stuff in there? No, it came right from the author, the one that knew, the one that wrote down the story the way it was meant to be written and told. None of those distractions are in the way. And so you get a cleaner look at it, an outside look that is powerful. It's like the difference between watching a fictional movie or a documentary. Documentary, you got to look through a prism like, well, are they getting paid? To, you know, was the message there? What kind of, you know, what kind of studies? Is there bias? All that's out the window with fiction. It's a clean, honest look at something one that you embrace, an escape, if you will. And no wonder people get so involved in these stories and these myths. No wonder kids and other people get so, you know, fixated on things like Star Wars. What I'm trying to do is justify, I guess, why this is one of the most powerful and compelling creation stories I've ever heard. And how selfish would I be 
to withhold that from anyone. And I'm deeply in the realm of nerd right now. This comes from a book called The Silmarillion, which is basically a backstory to The Lord of the Rings. It reads like a Bible. And we are only concerning ourselves today with the very start of it. The first chapter, really. And it's the origin story of the world as told by the elves. Now, I'm not going to veer into copyright territory and you know, read from it, but I will say it's written very beautifully. Almost Shakespearean. There are just some amazing passages in it. The writing, the it's so touched. But the story goes like this. In the beginning. Before the flow of time, before anything. In the depths of void, in the void, there is this place called the Timeless Halls. And Eru, Eru Iluvatar, the creator, he exists. He possesses something called the Flame Imperishable. Before anything else, he, cr he creates the Ainur. They're essentially angels. They are beautiful. And they are mighty, and they live with him in the, the timeless halls. And they sort of just wander around and sing. Sometimes in small groups, but each kind of, to, you know, they kind of keep to their own device. And so, he presents them with thought in the form of music, and he listens as they kind of pick up these themes, and they elaborate on them, and they kind of interpret them as they would. Each of them having their own distinct voice and flavor. And at first they sing by themselves, but they start, to, they, they start to listen to each other and hear each other, sometimes in small groups, and they start to realize that singing together makes the music more beautiful. And so they decide to kind of collaborate. And their music grows into until it becomes a, a symphony, basically. A very majestic symphony. Now there comes a time when this Eru gathers all of them, they have these sort of assistants or lesser kind of secondary angels called the Maiar. So he gathers all the Ainur and the Maiar and he declares to them a mighty theme. It says, unfolding to them things greater and more wonderful than he had yet revealed. And he asks them if they would make this great music while he sat and listened. And that if, that free will is, I feel, a very important theme of this whole entire story. So at first, each of them, they start to sing. And their voices ring forth as if they were harps and lutes and pipes and trumpets and strings and, and harmonies of choirs. And they begin to weave this theme into this music. And these interchanging melodies rise up and they're woven in harmony. And it fills and they spill out into the void, making the void less so. And it's said that a music like this has never been heard ever since. And never will until the end of time when the themes will be played aright which implies that that means initially they're going to be played wrong. And then you meet Melkor. He's the most powerful among these Ainur, kind of a Lucifer vibe. And he makes a discord in this theme as he tries to sort of increase his power and glory of the part that's assigned to himself. And we're told that because of his, his Melkor has been wandering in the void in search for the imperishable flame for himself. But and because of this, his thoughts have become strange and unlike those of the others. And the desire grows within him to bring into being things of his own. And it seems to him he's impatient of the of the void, impatient of its emptiness. And he fails to understand that the fire is not out there in the void, but it lives in Eru, the creator alone. So in any case, his rebellion continues, and uh, his music gets louder and louder, his discord, and uh, many of the Ainu around him kind of fell silent and their thought was disturbed. His music has no harmony, and it's, with, it's like rep, rep, repetitious violence. He tries to overpower the other music and assert his dominance and some actually embrace his theme some of them are near him and kind of go along with his theme and this happens until the, you know there's a raging storm of sound kind of warring with each other and now this at first the Luvatar, smiling raises his hand stops the song introduces a new theme and the same thing happened this time melkor gets even louder and more and more join in on with him than before and then the second time Iluvatar does it, his face is stern, and he begins a new theme. And it says, this one was soft and slow at first, like a ripple, but grew and slowly built up and grew into a harmony full of such sorrow from which its beauty chiefly came. It's an amazing line. Its beauty chiefly came from the sorrow. And this is another important theme. And this third time, Melkor still tried to challenge it and, and contend with it. But there was a war of sound more violent than before, and the halls were shaking, and many of the Ainur were really disturbed and stopped, and many more of them even joined in with Melkor. Yet even his most triumphant notes were somehow woven back into the melody, and still it became beautiful. And I imagine like classical music, like a really soft, a really loud timpani and cymbals, and then back into this sweet sound of the flutes and, and soft strings, and the whole music, while it can be very cacophonous at times, it is overall beautiful. It's the way that I imagine it. And this time, Eru Iluvatar rises up, and his face was terrible to behold. And he raises up his hands, and in one chord, deeper than the abyss, the music stops. And his words are like, 
the following. Mighty are the Ainur, and mightiest among them is Melkor. But that he may know, and all the Ainur, that I am a Luvatar. Those things that you have sung, I will show them forth, that you may see what you have done. And you, Melkor, shall see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall, shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. So essentially, anything you try to come up with all started with me anyway. And the more you try to sow discord, I will use you as a tool to make things far more beautiful than you can even comprehend. Melkor gets punked out and, and then he speaks with them more concerning the music and the dire ramifications of everything that's going to pass should any discord be brought forth. And he leads them into this void and he, he speaks. He says, behold your music. And he shows them a vision and he unveils to them the vision of the world that they had created through their song. A world that was globed amidst the void with a firmament and held distinct from the emptiness that surrounded it, surrounded by innumerable stars. It's a flat cluster of four continents in what's known as the Great Lake, and they are struck with awe. And the history of it unfolds as a vision, and each of them sees the role that each of them had in its creation. See, their individuality created the flavor of the world. They each kind of had their own distinct part to play. And it's it's this this free will that he gives them that they can, they can sing or they, or they don't have to sing. It's their choice. But it's their artistry that he's relying on. Artistry, their individuality is what creates the world. And as they watch this vision of what could be, they are struck with awe at this, at this that their music had the power to bring into being this, tan, this reality. And then the world that they're watching begins to stir with life. And they're amazed to see the what's called the children of Luvatar appear. And these are beings that had not been made known to them before. They they are they are amazed at what their creator has done, this this third theme that came from him. These were the firstborn, the elves, and the followers, which was the race of men. And this is born of a theme that was not theirs. And in the way that you might have a significant other or someone you've known forever suddenly display a world-class talent and you're shocked that they had it in them. This is sort of the feeling they have, and they're amazed at this. And then he removes the vision, and Iluvatar, in his wisdom, he understands the yearning in them, and their hearts, for this world to be made real. And he spokes them, saying, okay, they're very anxious for this to be, so he says, let it happen. And he sends forth this flame, and perishable into the world, and uh, many of the spirits who had dwelt in the timeless halls came, and they descended, eager to embody all that they had learned from him, and to prepare the world for the coming of his children. Okay, so then he starts speaking to them great wisdom and things that they will eventually, all this knowledge he's imparting, to use. And many of the spirits, these Ainur and these Maya, many of them who dwelt in the timeless halls, they answered the call and they chose. They descended, eager to embody all that they learned to prepare the world for the coming of men and elves and animals and everything else. And they, the ones that descended into what's called Arda, which is the world, will be known as the Valar. And the deal is, is that their fate is bound to it. So they can't leave until the whole thing plays out. That's the commitment. And Melkor, of course, is one of the first ones to go. And he's lying to himself at first that he wants to go there and, and do, make right and order all things for good for the children. But really, his heart is not to cherish them. He wants to bring them under his sway. And he wants dominion. And he wants followers. And he wants to be the Lord. And he wants... Now, couldn't Ero Luvatar just have stopped... Melkor from the beginning? Of course he could have. Of course he could have. But what does that do? Is that really free will? Is it free will if something only behaves because you make it? You see, to, to my brain, without the evil, we don't know what's good. See, true heroism, it's not that the hero wins. It's not that he's brave enough and strong enough and bold enough and savvy enough. It's not where true glory comes from. True glory comes from the hero who becomes a hero not by virtue of the outcome, but even when he knows all is lost, when he believes that there is no hope, when they are outclassed, outmatched, outnumbered in every way, and they're sure to lose, and yet he fights anyway. He keeps going anyway. This is true heroism. This is true glory. And it is often is the message in here, in order for the creator to actually experience the love from a creation, it has to have free will, or it's not real love. And how can you get joy out of it? In the same way, when you make a stand, when you make a stand for truth, no matter what that truth is to you, when you hold true to your principles, even when you don't have to, that's the glory. Yet that couldn't exist 
if you didn't have the weak ones, the ones that choose not to sing, because of the one that chooses to work against humanity, because of the one that chooses to go with the flow, because it's easier, because of that one, when you do choose principle, it creates the glory. If there were nobody doing bad things, then what? how would anything good stand out? It couldn't. And so that's why the world is full of sorrow, because the discord, it comes with free will. That's part of the price. Some people are not going to do right. Some people are not going to follow the law. Some people are not going to play right. And you don't have to either. But the fact that you do, despite that, shows the contrast between the opposite choice. And that's what I see in this community and, and the few of you that I have had some interactions with, which that's what I see in you. That's, that's where we connect. We connect on that principle. But it, we wouldn't be able to recognize the good in each other if there hadn't been such a sea of assholes and lost people. So in that way, if you are going to choose to find joy in the world and in the deeds of people, then you need the opposite. And I'm not trying to say it's about glory. I'm saying in order to know that choices you make are authentic, that you're not following some prescribed plan, which to me is the meaning, it's the joy of humanity, is having the free will, the ability to create and the ability to choose what you want to do, even within the limited roles that we have based on the societal governance. The fact is, no matter what your limitations, you still have a choice to make. And because of that, because of how shitty some people's choices are, therefore you can recognize easily the good in people. And it's the yin and the yang, and it is the balance and the flow, and the music is sad. And maybe we're in a sad part of the song. Maybe this is just a sad song in general. Perhaps that's from where its beauty chiefly comes. And perhaps we aren't going to save the world for us. Maybe we're just paving the way so that later on, something actually seals the day. Would you still do it? Would you still fight your own fight in your own way in the best way you know how? Even if you knew it was not going to be saved for you, you would never experience the joys of it? I think you would. So to me, you are the hope. And together, maybe we just need to trust that what we're doing, we need to do it until it fails. And perhaps, maybe, there can be something that enlarges it at the moment of its failure. When you take something farther than anyone else, spend every drop of your power and will to get to your destined point, and no, no theme can be set forth that did not come from the Creator. And even at the evil's most triumphant notes... It will be woven back and used to make the story and the song even more beautiful. Whatever suspicions you may hold about this time of year and the significance of it, and whether or not it's historically accurate, whether or not it's a perversion, whether or not it's been commercialized, whatever it is that you think, I hope that you are able to take heart and recharge with friends and family or however you do it, and fatten yourself up, so to speak, and prepare yourself in any way that you can. Embrace yourself, because I feel like this song is about to hit its most tumultuous movement. If based on what has happened and trying to predict what will happen, I would say that we're going to need all the strength that we can get. Maybe this is a sad part of the song, but I trust that it's going to be beautiful by the end. I will see you. Ooh.